Hey, look, I'm a little kid. <laughs> Hold on, let me get back to regular size, bro. Hold on. Welcome to Chess, ladies and gentlemen. All right, man, I appreciate everybody very much for stopping by. So I did go back, uh, and I had, I got another uh, Chess Olympiad game. Uh, and this is kind of a twofer because I did have somebody request uh, Ramesh, Ramesh Babu Pragnananda uh, a couple days ago. And so, you know, this is like combining Wesley So with, uh, with, with Prague, as he's known. So, I, I do have uh, that game uh, from round eight. And uh, so, yeah, man, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting game. It's got some chances in it and stuff like that. Uh, but like I said, I appreciate you guys very much. Um, anybody who is coming from uh, the Philippines, as always, I will say mabuhay. Kamusna aking makaibigan. Hello ulit. Mabuding pagbari ingat lagi. I appreciate you guys very much for stopping by. Uh, and anybody who is coming from India, it's kind of interesting because Prague is from Chennai, same as uh, Viswanathan Anand. And so when he played the Olympiad, he actually played in his hometown. So not very many people. I, I don't think they're ever going to play a, a chess, like a major chess tournament in Waco, Texas, which is where I'm from. But it's actually Colleen. But anyways, Waco, everybody knows Waco. Well, Kind of everybody. Depends on where you live in the world. Anyways, uh, it is really cool, I think, for you to be able to play in your hometown where you were born. So all of my people that are coming from India, especially Tamil Nadu, uh, I will say Vanakam uh, and Nandri. I appreciate you guys very much for stopping by. If you guys are ready to go, let's take a look and see what we got for this game. So we got the move E4. We got C5. So we do have the Sicilian defense on the board. Nothing too crazy. I mean, this is probably played... You know, I'd say at this level, probably half the time, uh, I might be a little bit wrong. But usually the Sicilian is what you'll see. You might see some E5s. Those are going to be pretty much, you know, what black is going to be trying to play for. Uh, and uh, after they see the move E4, and then you see other stuff from there. We got knight to F3. We got knight to C6. Uh, we see the move knight to C3, and then we do have the G6. So you know that we're either getting into the accelerated dragon or a dragon type situation. Uh, and we do see d4. You really kind of have to play d4 here uh, because you can't really wait because once the bishop comes on g7, it's going to be pretty almost impossible to push, uh, you know, uh, d4. Not impossible, but it's going to be a lot harder. So pawn takes d4. We got knight taking d4. Uh, and then uh, we do have the accel accelerated dragon. We got bishop to g7. We got bishop to e3. And then we have knight uh, to f6. And the difference between the dragon, the regular dragon, and the accelerated dragon um, is the fact that d6 is not played. Uh, you know, I will go back and show you what I used to get into uh, when I was playing myself after knight to f3. A lot of the times you'll see a d6. Uh, and then pawn uh, goes to d4. You'll see pawn takes, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3. So, of course, you guys know you can go into the knight orphan in this position too. Uh, but if you do see g6... Uh, I was a bishop to e3 guy. We got bishop to g7. We got f3. Castles, queen to d2, knight to c6, and g4. Uh, and I was a Yugoslav attack. And I believe that, I mean, it, it's it's very rare that you'll actually win this as black. Um, it's very sharp, but um, because of the fact that white did, or black did play d6, they used the tempo to do so. So if we fast forward, like I said, to the position that we had, Basically, sometimes black will say, man, I really just want to get rolling super quick. Uh, and I just hit my piece down. Uh, I want to get rolling super quick. So I am going to not play D6. And also, sometimes people want to play D5 directly. Uh, so it just kind of depends on what they want to do. But this is, as opposed to the regular dragon, this is a much better uh, positional um, type of situation. Uh, and, you know, you just a little bit more flexible with your D pawn. So we do see the move bishop to c4. And this is trying to really discourage a d5 because, of course, in this particular position, uh, you cannot go d5 because bishop to c4 is preventing that move from coming. We do see the uh, castles by black. Uh, we got bishop down to b3. And you guys, I mean, you guys have seen some, some you know, uh, some games recently where this bishop was really crazy on this diagonal. And I was mentioning to you guys when I used to play against the Sicilian myself like this, you know, bishop, uh, you know, there were some tactics on like E6s and F7s and things like that. So you definitely got to be careful. We do see the move D6 now. Uh, so we are still in Accelerated Dragon just because of the way we played out of the immediate opening. 
Uh, we do see the move f3. So, I mean, it's, we're kind of hybriding the situation. We got queen down to a5. Uh, and, I mean, without this f3 move, queen to a5 can actually be pretty annoying in these positions uh, because knight taking e4 is on tap. So, to make sure that we don't have any issues, uh, we see uh, Wesley So go queen to d2. And, I mean, we didn't really have any issues before, but, I mean, whenever you do fling your central pawns out, you know, black is going to be trying to find a way uh, to, you know, you know, mess you up a little bit. That's pretty much what the game of chess is. We got knight taking d4, bishop taking d4. We got bishop to e6. And this is all very standard stuff. As you can see, you know, a lot of what black is doing is they're playing on the queen side. Uh, they have castled king side. And, you know, white hasn't really decided where they're going to go yet. Uh, but sometimes in these particular positions, especially with like the, you know, the position that I showed you before, like, you know, the dragon Yugoslav, you'll see queen side castles and you'll see king to b1 and you'll see g4, h4, h5. And it's like, it's just a race to try to see who could literally just like, you know, murder the other one's king as immediately as possible. Uh, so we do see uh, the move h4. Uh, and then we have the novelty of the game, which is b5, which is like completely shocking to me, simply because b5 is like one of the most common moves you'll see. Uh, a lot of the times you will see black literally give this pawn away. Uh, and, you know, once white captures, you're going to be seeing like a rook F to B8 or rook A to B8. Uh, and, you know, especially if you're already castled, uh, this is giving black a lot, a lot of play. Uh, but of course, you're not giving away the pawn in this position. But you guys kind of see what I mean. You know, the bishop a lot of the time comes to e6. We see one of these rooks swinging over, getting somewhere in here. A lot of the times you'll see a rook swinging over and actually sacrificing itself uh, on c3, which is what I saw all the time when I was playing the dragon. Uh, so we do see the move h5. And, you know, we're trying to, you know, one of the major things that black has to focus on when they're playing these types of positions, especially like Sicilian with, you know, when you fee and kettle the bishop is absolutely under like every circumstance trying to hold on to that bishop that dark square bishop uh, because if you notice if you move the dark square bishop you just literally have dark square ho dark squared holes everywhere uh, in your position so you definitely do not want that so you definitely don't want to go into trading uh, that bishop down uh, so we see bishop takes b3 in the position and we see pawn takes b3 but if we back up uh if we did uh you know if because white is basically trying to trade that bishop off if white can trade that dark square bishop then they're basically going to be having like a big advantage so that is what h4 h5 is looking to try to do try to deflect this knight over and if you can get black to bite on that uh you have a, a really really great position after the knight takes on h5 you would be seeing bishop taking uh g7 and you kind of want to take with the king uh and then you would be seeing uh g4 and i mean you're gonna be castling this side the rook is gonna be swinging over you have this open file here so i mean things can get really dangerous really quickly uh if you are black so you got to be kind of careful uh so we definitely do not want to see that as black uh so like i said we did see bishop takes b3 pawn takes b3 uh, and then we do see the move E5 and, you know, black is trying to back up, uh, you know, white's pieces. And you have to kind of be careful because when you're playing Sicilians, uh, this D6 pawn can become a very, very gigantic weakness. Uh, so you have to really make for sure uh, that black, that white cannot gang up on that pawn. So these are just kind of the ideas uh, as far as when you're playing from the white side, playing from the black side of these, you know, these types of positions. We do see the move bishop to e3, just backing that bishop up. We got the move b4. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have pretty much knight to d5 is what you want to do, but you can always back it up too. You know, like I said, I mean, you are kind of thinking about, you know, maybe getting uh, a rook over here to d1 so you can try to put some pressure. But queen to a5 right now uh, is putting a little bit of pressure on this a2 pawn. Plus, you got b4 played, so it's kind of freezing all these pawns, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, we do see knight to d5. We got knight taking d5, uh, and then we do have pawn taking d5. And this has kind of solved black's problem because now, you know, this d6 pawn is not accessible from the front. So, you know, black has kind of solved one of their only weaknesses. As you can see, everything is pretty equal, pretty even. Uh, we do see the move e4, and then we got the move f4. Uh, and, you know, this is, like I said, maintaining, uh, you know, the dark square bishop. That's the major thing that you have to be making sure that you're doing. We do see the move queen to b5, which, 
I mean, it's not really too much annoying to white because, I mean, they're not going to be castling anyway. King to f2 is definitely going to be a move that you'll see in this type of position. Uh, you absolutely do not want to castle queenside because of this open file. Uh, and, of course, you cannot castle into dangerous territory. Uh, so we do see the move f5, which looks kind of crazy because you're like, man, I mean, it looks like black, white is just going to, like, rip my position open. But we do see the absolute best move in the position, which is rook uh, a to c8. Uh, and like I said, I mean, we're taking over this, uh, this trying to take over this file. We do see the rook going over to f1. We see bishop to e5, and then we do see that king to f2 that I was talking about. And we actually, if you are Prognananda in this position, you actually have a really, really nice move that you can make in this position. It seems kind of counterintuitive, but black has an opportunity to win a pawn kind of in this position. If you want to pause the video and try to see what move that is, go ahead and do so. Okay, so, I mean, like I said, the major thing that Prague is making sure that he does in this position uh, is not give away uh, this dark square bishop. This dark square bishop is super, super key on making sure that he's not literally getting checkmated because if you can put a bishop here and then the queen comes here, I mean, you're literally just dead. Uh, absolutely. So, but the crazy thing is in this particular position, the highest best move in the position um, is actually a uh, pawn takes h5. And it might kind of seem weird because you're like, man, I'm just like opening up my king. But the thing about it is you definitely have some possibilities in this position. You have f6 that you can play. You're going to be freeing up your rook. The king can actually slide over to h8 and you can move rook to g8. And mainly because of this bishop, you really don't have a good way to penetrate. And of course, if you move the king over, move the rook over, I mean, you're looking at kind of eyeballing this square here. Uh, but... You know, some of the best play for either side is going to be bishop to h6, in which black can actually reply, not caring about their rook. They can just go queen to c5 with check, and then the king would step over to e2. You got the move e3, which seems kind of interesting. You're giving uh, away a pawn after you just got a pawn, but what you're trying to do is disconnect your bishop, their queen and their bishop, and also make sure that they can't just hop in on the square uh, and everything is all everything. So after the bishop takes on e3, we, you would be seeing queen to c2, rook a to c1, and then queen to e4. And there's a very legitimate reason why this pawn was giving up on this e-file. As you notice, the king is sitting on the e-file, uh, and there's only a couple pieces in the way, and I mean, the rook can swing over to f8, or to e8, and I mean, you have a very, very dominant position uh, as black. So if you recognize that even though it looks kind of scary to give away that, you know, to open that position up on your king, and you're thinking, okay, after bishop to h6, I got this check, then I mean, you know, I don't know, man, maybe you, you would have won against Wesley So, because that's like a really, really great thing to do. But what we saw in the game, after king to f2, we did see the queen coming down to d3, just offering a trade, which is like the second best move. So this is a very logical, like, thought process as well, going into, uh, you know, just the type of in game where queens are exchanged. So we do see queen taking d3, pawn taking d3, rook going over to d1. We see rook down to c1 with check. And this is a very, very strong rook on the 7th. Uh, so you can't just let that rook survive. After the king goes to f3, we see rook taking b2. And you have to go rook to f2. I mean, it's not like you're going to completely lose if you go another move. But, I mean, this rook is literally trying to chomp up everything on the 7th. And that's why rooks on the 7th are so dangerous. So you have to try to combat it somehow. So rook takes f2. We see bishop taking f2. We see pawn taking f5. Uh, we got bishop taking a7. And we do understand that rook to a8 is going to be coming. Rook comes to a8. We see the bishop backing up to e3. And then we see the rook taking on a2. And, I mean, you know, Prague has had a really, really great position for quite a while in this game. You know, ever since rook a to c8 came, you know, black has really kind of been in a driver's seat. Once the soul is not getting, like, you know, just horribly beat. But, I mean, the initiative... And, I mean, the advantage has definitely been in Prague's favor for a long time. The problem is it kind of takes some computer-like precision to keep playing that way. And, I mean, we're all human beings. So, uh, we do see the move a Rook a takes D3. Uh, and it's this point in the game uh, that, you know, Prague has a very, very dominant position. Uh, and that Rook on the 7th rank is doing monstrous jobs so there there was a very critical point in the game right here uh but pragnananda actually goes rook up to a8 and the thing about it is like i mean why would you move that rook off the seventh it was perfectly beautiful unless you're getting attacked uh, like you know your rook is getting attacked and you have to retreat you know sometimes like you know you're looking at a position and you kind of have the position like built up so much to where 
you know, maybe you're like imagining threats or something like that, or you just want to play super safe. But sometimes that could kind of come back to bite you. Uh, because like I said, Rook back all the way back on the back rank for your, I mean, you know, on your own king and stuff like that. It's definitely not as monstrous as we saw down here. So of course, I mean, if you got Rook down to D2, you know, you have the ability to think, okay, am I going to retreat or am I trade or what? But like I said, I mean, in this particular position, you didn't have any threats of that. So, I mean, we were definitely looking at like a rip to B2 or maybe just an F6 or, you know, king down to G7, getting a little bit more active. Uh, in this particular position, if we did see the move king to G7, this will kind of be like the computer, like I was saying, you know, the bishop down to D2 and then F6. And I mean, you are in a really, really great position. I mean, this bishop is literally just completely stuck in the center of the board. You got the king that's, you don't have any more like, you know, dark square weaknesses or, you know, like back rank issues and stuff like that with this bishop trying to cut you off, right? So, I mean, this is just like a really, really beautiful way to play. And plus, rook to b2 can come, bishop to c3 can come and stuff like that. I mean, you know, you definitely have, you know, a little bit that you're playing for here. But like I said, we did see rook back to a8, which kind of does make it a little passive. We see bishop down to d2. We see rook over to b8. We got the king down to e2. Rook goes to b5. We see rook up to f3. We see rook taking d5, and then we see bishop taking b4. And it is in this position uh, that, the, that the players do agree to a draw. And it's basically because, like, I mean, it's so super dead even in this position. If I just show you guys, like, you know, one possible variation you can get into, I'll kind of explain at the end. You would probably see rook to b5. You got bishop coming back to d2. You're laterally protecting that pawn with the rook. You see king over to f8. You got pawn pushing up to b4. You see f4 because you're trying to, you know, if white is going to be doing something, you're trying to deflect its pieces away from that pawn on, a, on b4. The rook would come and probably swing over to b3. You see king over to e8. You got the king up to f3. You got rook over to d5 attacking that bishop. Bishop taking, bishop taking, king taking. The rook is going to take that pawn. You got the move b5. Uh, so you're going to have to do some defensive work with that king. King goes down to c7. You got b6. King to c8. Uh, b7 would check and then the king slides over to b8 you would probably see g4 and then the rook would go over to d5 and then you'd have rook down to b1 and the major thing you have to think about in this position is these two pawns aren't really going anywhere the king is completely immobilized and at some point most likely you know this rook the king is going to kind of hang out in this section of the board just to make sure this pawn doesn't score a touchdown. Uh, but you definitely have some movability with this rook uh, as far as coming up and putting some pressure on this pawn or just swinging over here and starting to collect these pawns. And then you're pretty much going to get traded down uh, into a king and a rook versus a king and a rook. So as you guys know, that is a completely drawn game. Uh, so that is most likely what you're looking at in this particular situation. That's just one way to go about it. But there's a lot of different ways that you can just kind of play, you know, solid moves and just maintain the position and just pretty much draw the game so because it is dead completely even both players said hey man i've seen these types of end games before so let's go ahead and just you know call it a day and draw and go home so that is what they did so that is that game uh you know like i said i mean you know Prague was definitely putting a lot of pressure uh on wesley so in this one but it did kind of get to where they both just were about equal strength in this position so malaka c uh wesley so at Ramesh Babu Pragnananda, I appreciate you guys very much. Nandri and Merming Salamat, Aking Makai Bigan, and I'll see y'all next time.